Good morning. Good morning. How you guys doing? I'm doing well, thank you. Well, you guys can stand up and let's pray. Let's bow our heads. Dearly Father, we thank you for this morning. Uh, we just thank you, God, uh, that you love us so much. And I was just reading that prayer uh, that you, Jesus, prayed to the Father. And uh, you pray that we would have a unity just like you and the Father. And I thank you, God, for that. I pray uh, that we would have that unity, that we would have that love in this place, that you would fill us, fill this place with your Holy Spirit, we ask, God. And we just ask that we can surrender ourselves, that we can surrender our hearts, that we can bow down and lay everything down before you. And so I pray, Father, that whatever is on our mind, whatever we've put before you this week, I pray that we can tear those idols down and tear everything down that is not of you. That we can, uh, that we can worship you and lift you high above all those things, and I just pray that we we can keep you there, that we won't uh, continue to put things above you, uh, but that we will just look to you and be able to worship you throughout the week. So we love you, God, and we thank you for this time that we can worship together as a family. It's in Jesus' mighty name I pray, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen.
Let's give the Lord a clap. Yes, you yeah. You guys may agree one another. Good morning. Don't freak out for those of you who are worshipers. We're going to have some more time to worship. But, uh, amen. There you go. But uh, I want to talk about worship because I really believe that that's one of the key things to do. You know, Jeremiah says, remember the old ways, and sometimes, how many old people think sometimes the old ways are a little better than the new ways, amen? Uh, I thank God for the technology, but we've kind of, with technology, we've gotten some bad things too, and uh, kind of forgotten things. So today we're going to talk about worship. I think it's going to be a two-part series. I have four points, and I don't, I want to give us time to worship, so I don't know how far I'm going to get. The title of today's message is, How to Welcome the Lord's Presence in Worship. And uh, how many remember a couple weeks ago, probably uh, right before Mother's Day or during Mother's Day, I mentioned that I had asked God uh, why his presence wasn't real consistent here. How many, how many sense the presence of the Lord here in worship? How many? Raise your hand. Okay, good. But how many know I believe it can even be greater? Agreed? I, I've, I will tell you this real quick. I... Uh, I went to Grace Chapel in town here, and I was a Baptist, and my friends went there, and uh, they were charismatic. Grace Chapel is a charismatic church. It was on Pima and Wilmot, and it's a totally different church now, but John Castile was there, and, and I had heard about it, so I went there as a Baptist to disprove tongues, to disprove the gifts, and disprove everything. And I'm sitting there, and all of a sudden, I have my hands crossed like this. I'm not into it, and all of a sudden, I just start weeping my eyes out. I just start crying, and God just touched me so mightily, and I, it was never the same. How, how many have experienced that in worship? Right? And, and when you, you know, that's the difference between just singing songs and worshiping. Because when you worship, you should have an encounter. I love what um, Jack Hayford said. He says, if you worship the Lord and you're not changed, you probably haven't worshiped. Amen? Because worship should change you. Worship should convict you. Worship should encourage you. And worship should spur you on to go for God. But if it doesn't, then probably you haven't really worshipped. So I asked the Lord, why isn't your presence consistent here? Why does it seem like it goes up and it goes down and it goes up and it goes down? I said, why? And, and, and Pastor John, my pastor, I, I went to Grace after that encounter. And he, he used to say to me that learn to ask the Lord questions. And, and how many know we should be able to ask God questions? Jesus said, my sheep will hear my voice. And they will not listen to the voice of another. So you should be able to hear the voice of God. Amen? Remember the uh, hymn? I don't know which one. I always forget it. But it says, he, you ask me how I know he lives. He walks with me and talks with me along life's merry way. He lives, he lives. Right, yeah. All right. And, and so, <laughs> there you go. I wish I could sing. But anyway, thank God he says make a joyful noise. But he, you know, he, we should be able to hear his voice. So I asked the Lord this, and he gave me four points. And really, he did. I mean, I heard it as clear as day. And see if you bear witness with this. The first thing God said to me, the Lord said to me, there's, not, there's no real reverence for me in my church anymore. How, how many could humbly say that? There isn't the respect and revere. It says in the last days, people will not respect their parents. They, they won't respect authority. And we see that. How many people hear this? What do you hear people say all the time? My God would never do this. How many know... As Ravi Zacharias said, we're not to stand in judgment of God. God is to stand in judgment of us. 
Amen? But our society stands in judgment of God. My God would never do this. My God would love homosexuality. My God wouldn't say there's many ways to him. But what are they doing? They're breaking the number one commandment. It says what? Thou shalt have no other gods before me. You're making yourself God because you're saying, if I was God, this is how I would do it. How many know? You're not God. And neither am I. And we need to know that, amen? And we need to find out like, how God wants to be worshipped. And he says, so he said, no real reverence. So we need to look at that. Then the second thing he said, very few of my people really humble themselves before me. How many can admit that? The way we look at God today is we look at God as kind of our homeboy. There's even a pastor in Phoenix. He's pretty big. If you had said his name, oh, I'll be nice. But he has hats that Jesus is my homeboy. How many know Jesus is your friend, but he's not your homeboy? He's not your dude. He's not your pal. He's not, whoosh, high five, Jesus, woo! I mean, he, he's God, amen? I mean, yes, he's a friend. Don't get me wrong. But how many know he is also God Almighty? Let me give you an example of this real quick in this. When John, remember John the Beloved, he used to snuggle with Jesus, you know, and kind of make us men, guys are trying to be macho, that's a little weird, but he would put his head in his lap, right? You girls go, that's precious, right? But he put his head in his lap, and, and remember, he did that, but then when he saw Jesus in Revelation 1 in glorified state, what happened? It says he fell like a dead man. How I many know oh, that's what's going to happen when we see Jesus? You know that song, I can only imagine, will I stand in his presence or all f- will in awe will I fall? You're going to fall, not Will I? You're going to fall. And then God's going to lovingly pick you up and say, and dust you off and say, hey, welcome to heaven. And just know that. That's how awesome your God is. And we need to revere him. If we're going to fall in heaven, we might as well start falling and revere him now. Amen? So we're not shocked in heaven. We go, whoa! You know, we're ready to high five and just fall. We might as well start bowing now. The second thing or third thing he said to me is none of my people or very few of my people really bow the knee. Really bow the knee. And, you know, think about it. I was raised, any Catholics out there? Do you remember the Catholics? The, the little kneel thing, up, down, up, down, kneel, kneel, up. Kneel. And I, if, you're, if you haven't been in Catholic church, we only went Christmas and Easter. We, we didn't know what, oh, now? Oh, you know, and everyone would be kneeling. We'd be kneeling and they're getting up, and we just didn't know what we were doing. But how many know that there's something about kneeling? There really is. And I think... Because we hear this, have been so grace oriented, we say, oh, that's, that's legalism, or that's, you know, God knows my heart. How many know <laughs> if you went to see, well, I'm getting ahead of myself, just, just we need to bow, okay? And the last thing, I said, Lord, is there anything else you want to show me? And God said this, I want more heartfelt worship. How many know a lot of people say this, God sees my heart? I don't have to raise my hands. I don't have to sing. I can just sit there like this because God sees my heart. Okay, uh, could you imagine proposing to your wife that way? Read my heart. <laughs> you, know, you know, if you're happy and you know it, your face, you should be able to express it. And, and, and for those you say, but I can't sing, Pastor Craig. Psalms 98.4, make a joyful noise to the Lord. Lord, I love you. Right? You guys are awake? Hello? That's kind of funny, right? Just make a noise. Just, just joyfully. Just go, ow! If you can, you know, yell something. But make a joyful noise. Don't just sit back. I, I, I know I'm a sinful man, and that hurts me when I see people just stand there and not worship. How much more does it hurt your Heavenly Father who died in your place, who gave His Son, when you can't even make a joyful noise or worship? So we're going to look at these Four things, probably more like three things. But we're going to look at these today and see how God, what God, he said those things to me. And what does the Bible say about those things? Because that's important. It doesn't matter what I heard, but it matters what the Bible says about these things. So let's pray. Father God, thank you for this day. I thank you for everyone here. And I pray, Lord, I don't want the biggest church. I just want a people who love you with all their heart soul, mind, and strength, and love their neighbors, that, they, that this is the remnant. In these last days, this is a church that worships you in spirit and in truth, that is sincere, Lord, that doesn't put on a show, doesn't do it to be seen by men, but says, God, I love you. I am so thankful you died in my place. You gave your son, and now in love, I give my life to you and your will. Please, God, speak to us today. Lord, Zechariah 4, 6 says, not by might, not by power, but by my spirit. Lord, this message, unless your spirit comes, 
It's just going to be another message, but I ask that you would anoint my tongue. I pray that you would speak through me, and I pray if this is your heart, which I believe I heard from you, then I ask you would just burn it into your hearts and minds of your people. You'd write on their hearts, and they wouldn't be able to forget it. And I pray, God, that you would anoint them to hear your word and to be those good ground, that good hearts that will receive your word 30, 60, and 100-fold harvest, that this word would change the way they live. And that this would be known as not a church that sometimes worships you, but it'll be a church that always worships you, where you are the focal point. You are the center stage. You are the attraction. You aren't outside knocking to get in. You are welcome. The doors are blown open wide for you to be worshipped, for you to be honored, and for you to be yielded to. Bless your people. Speak to us today, we cry, and pour out your spirit upon us. Pour out your glorious presence in this place. In Jesus' name, amen. So the Lord said there's not real reverence. So I looked up in the Bible dictionary, I looked up the word reverence. And hear this, it says, a feeling of profound awe and respect because of his majesty. Remember the old Jack Haver song? Majesty, worship, right? His majesty, his holiness. God, he says, arouses feelings of reverence in those who worship and serve him. And I like this word. How many like old words sometimes? I like old words. He says, shamefacedness. Have you ever heard that word? Shamefacedness. I, I went, shamefacedness? I've never heard. Has anyone heard that word? Shamefacedness? A couple people. I was like, shamefacedness. What does that mean? You know, what are you doing? I mean, shamefacedness. It means excessive modesty. Isn't it amazing? Shamefacedness. You know, whenever I deal, whenever I minister or talk to Oriental people, a lot of times they're humble and they don't even look. If you're a leader, they'll go like this, oh, pastor, oh, pastor. And they bow and they don't want to even look you in the eyes. Shamefacedness, humble, giving honor. How many know that we need to have that heart with God? Not, what's up, dude? Humble. You know, if we went to visit President Trump, or let's say you might say, oh, I don't like Trump. President Reagan, how's that? You like Reagan? We go visit. You wouldn't just go there and you wouldn't just kick your feet up on his, on his desk. You wouldn't just help yourself to his fridge. You wouldn't just do. You would show respect. You'd be shamed. You'd be humble. Because you're in a president, you're with the president, and you need to be humble, you need to be respectful, and that's what we need to have, that modesty with God. Hebrews 12, 28 says this. It says, therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably. How many want your service to be acceptable to God? You know, there's a lot of people, there's, the Bible says there's a way that seems right to men, but at the end it leads to death. So we want our service to be the way God wants it because we want it to be received by God, amen? Right? And so he says, serve God acceptably with, hear this, reverence, there's the word, and godly fear. For our God is a consuming fire. Isn't that amazing? You, you think, don't we just, what do we preach Jesus now? Lovey-dovey, little lamb, you know, cutesy-wootsy. Your God is a consuming fire. And you go, huh, okay. Even the New Testament, you go, that's, that's the Old Testament, God. New Testament, Ananias and Sapphira. Remember, they lied about, oh, we brought all the money. We sold our house, we brought our land, we gave you all the money, God. And he says, and Peter goes, why have you lied before the Holy Spirit? And they fell dead. And it says, great fear spread among them. How do I know? Amen. Some of you guys say, I tithe and give 1%. Tithe is 10%. Okay, thank God he doesn't do that right now, right? But... Great fear spread. It says they had great respect, but yet people were afraid of them. How many know we need to get that back to the church? If you saw someone die in the presence of God, you go, yes, Lord. You, know, you might bow a little. Right? And if you saw someone stand before God in heaven and go, whoo, and just puff of smoke, you might have some holy fear and reverence. And that's what Paul is saying. He's saying your God is a consuming fire. He consumes stuff. So you need to have that reverence and godly fear. Have you ever noticed that a lot of times when you humbly bow your knee, how, how many have heard God say, bow your knee in worship? Two of you. Okay, good. But, <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. But when you bow your knee, have you noticed every time you obey God in that, you will sense emotion from God? 
You, you either cry or you'll be filled with joy, but there's something when you obey God in that. But what does the devil tell you when you do that? Oh, you know, first thing I say, because I have no problem worshiping, but I, the devil always goes, up. Oh, people are going to say, oh, there goes Craig, you know, woo, wave, you know, doing the wave, bowing down, trying to look holy. There he goes. And the Lord goes, don't worry about it. I know your heart. Do it for me. Remember we sing that song, you know, what is that song? Uh, um, one, what do we say? One something, one just for, what? I can't remember the song. This is, but where he basically says, he goes, well, audience of one. What, I'm doing it for you, or, or I'm all alone. Just, just you and I here, just you and me here now. It's only you and me, but what do we do? It's only my neighbors watching me, Lord. Right? Don't we get afraid sometimes? We live, oh, someone's going to watch. Oh, right? Don't worry about it. Don't worry about your neighbor. Just go, I don't care what my neighbor thinks, Lord. This is for you and you only, Lord. Right? You should sing that. I don't care. Right? I don't care. And every time I've done that, every time I get on my face, every time I've bowed my head, every time I've lifted my hands, I've always felt the Lord's presence. And I want to tell you this, it isn't all about feeling, right? Because, you know, you can have goose pimples in a rock concert, but that doesn't, that's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about where all of a sudden you encounter the presence of God and God speaks to you and you go, I know he was, like it says in 1 Corinthians 14, surely God is in your midst. I encountered God today. I didn't just sing a bunch of songs. God spoke to me and touched my heart today. How, how many want that to be more regular in your life? I do. Then I looked up the Webster or the Webster's 1928 dictionary. How many have heard of that? Noel Webster was a Christian. He wrote a dictionary. How many? Know, it's pretty wild when God calls you to write a dictionary. God called Noel Webster to write a dictionary. He's a Christian. And if you go to the 1828, if you write the new Webster's, it's just it's just a regular dictionary. But the old 1828. You can get it online, and if you're a Bible student, I encourage you to get it because it's amazing. But here's what he says the definition of reverence. He says this, fear mingled with respect and esteem. How many know we need to esteem God more? And he says fear acceptable to God. There he is again, acceptable. An awful reverence. Isn't that weird? You go, awful? An awful reverence of divine nature proceeding from a just esteem of his perfections, which produces in us an inclination to his service, and I like this, and an unwillingness to offend him. How many know we need that more? An unwillingness to offend him. What are we taught today? Grace, grace, grace. God loves you. God loves you so much he wouldn't change a thing. Hey, don't worry about it. You're sinning. So you're fornicating. Don't worry about it. You're, you're, you're struggling with homosexuality. Don't worry about it. God doesn't care. How many know that is not true? I remember what we used to say in the Jesus movement. He used to say, Jesus loves you just the way you are, but he loves you so much he's not going to leave you this way. Remember that? He loves you, but he's moving you to righteousness. And he says, I don't want to do anything, that, uh, unwillingness to offend him. I love what my wife used to say to our kids about the fear of God. She used to say, the fear of God is not wanting to do anything that hurts God's heart. Isn't that good? And if you love somebody and you love, you care about somebody and you respect somebody, you want to please them. I remember being with Pastor John and I remember I would just want so much to please him. I would want, I would think, and then God was saying, I, I wish you'd treat me sometimes like you used to treat Pastor John, a man. A, a flawed man, he's a great man, but a man who is human. And sometimes we give more honor to men, especially military people, than we do to God. And we need to give God more honor than any other person in the whole world. Amen. Then I looked up the word humble in the 1828 dictionary. And he says, lowly, modest, meek, submissive, opposed to being proud, Remember the last days? What will be some of the last days? People will be proud, haughty, arrogant, assuming. How many know we need to not be assuming? We need to come into worship humbly and not just assume, hey, God sees my heart. I don't care how I, you know. Would you say that to President Trump? Hey, you, you know my heart, President. I, I voted for you. you. You would be humble. You would be respectful. You'd put on the nice suit if you had one or dress, and you would go, hi, Mr. President. You wouldn't go, what's up, dude? How's the hair? Cool. You wouldn't do that. You'd be escorted out quickly. I, mean, I want to tell you this. Do you ever wonder? We all suppose we have a guardian angel, right? Do you ever wonder if you ever embarrass your guardian angel a lot? 
I just wonder if my angel goes, how did I get saddled with this guy? Right? When I worship, when I just kind of go, eh, just you and me here, and I just do the motions. How, how many, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, but you know a lot of you have gone through the motions in worship. Just, eh, whatever, meh, meh. Right? What if you wanted to trump? Hey, how you doing? What's our weird hair? Hey, you know, you wouldn't do that because you'd be like, get him out of here. And we need to be that way with God to say, God, and, and, and I want to say this. God humbled me on this. And I'm going to say this. this is going to make people happy. This will make you love me. It's not to pick on any person. I'm picking on me first. But God really convicted me. If you were going to go to the White House, you wouldn't be late. You'd be on time. And God said to me, Craig, you got to lead by example because I a lot of times will come in late. Somebody goes, I know, and that's why I'm late. God said, you need to be showing by example. Now, I'm praying. So I can say, well, I'm praying. I'm preparing the message. I'm trying to get right with God, and, and everything's right, and I'm just kind of perfectionist. But God's saying, no, you need to be on time. As they used to say about parenting, what you do in moderation, your kids will do in excess. If you don't take church seriously, your kids won't take it. And I want to tell you, we need to start being on time because guess what? You come halfway through, it's hard to really catch up when everyone's worshiping. You come in, everyone's on their face. You're like, what's going on? Okay, it's hard. You feel out of it. Amen? You still love me? We need to try to be on time, you know? Because, you know, they always say Calvary time. How many of you, who cares about Calvary time? Jesus time. Right? You need to care what Jesus thinks. And, uh, you know, so don't assume that Jesus doesn't care about that or doesn't notice. In an evangelical sense, he says, having a low opinion of oneself. Isn't that amazing? You never hear that. Humble is having a low opinion. We're told we're king's kids. We're favored. We're chosen. We're, we're the head and not the tail. We're awesome. Right? Don't you hear most of the big pastors saying that? You're great. You're, you have a destiny. God's here to serve you. And I want to tell you this, guys, hear this. Apart from Christ, Jesus said you can do nothing. Apart from him, you can do nothing. So without Christ, you and I, you know what our worth is? I think it's $17 chemically, you know. I think if you sell it for a cadaver or maybe more. But really, you're about, I think it's like under 20 bucks. So you're really not worth a whole lot without Jesus. But hear this. I love what Ravi Zacharias says. He's, he's almost as smart as me. He's a really good guy. But no kidding. I'm just, yeah, (laughs) I was a real humble reverse, trust me. (laughs) No, I'm just kidding. kidding. I'm leaving, that's it, I'm gone. But uh, anyway, so, thank you, Tom. But uh, where was I now? I've lost it, I'm so prideful. No, here it is, but here's what Zarvi Zacharias, way smarter than me, said. He said, the reason you and I have worth is not our, here, what do we say? You gotta have self-worth. There's no self-worth in the Bible. The worth is, he says, the, the, the value of something is what someone's willing to pay for it. That's what gives something value. And why do we have value? Because G- God the Father was willing to give his son for you and I. That's what gives us value. Amen? So do you see how you need to come and worship humbly to say, God, I have great value because you gave your son for me and for all of you. But I don't go, hey, <laughs> here to help you out, Jesus. You know, look what you got here. I mean, Jesus, come on. Ooh. You know, C.S. Lewis used to have a thing called six pence, none the richer, meaning God bought us, but he didn't get a whole lot for his buying. And the only way you and I can be powerfully used is when we powerfully surrender and let him work in and through us. Amen? Amen. You don't help God out. You let God work through you. Amen? Amen. So I like that low opinion of oneself. James 4, 6 says this, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So if you're here today and you feel, man, I feel so resisted by God sometimes. I pray and I don't sense anything and I just don't sense the Lord's presence in worship. Then you need to ask yourself humbly or ask God, I should say, God, am I proud? Am I arrogant? Because the Bible says God resists the proud. That means he puts his hand against the proud. But hear this. He gives grace to the humble. Grace is unmerited, undeserved, unearned favor. How how many want that in a life? The grace of God, Paul says, may abound in you. That that you have grace. Well, how do you get it? By humbling yourself. You don't go by, hey, come on, God, move. No, 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 no. Try to ask your dad for the car keys like that. Dad, come on, give me the keys now. Oh, maybe not. 
But you say, Dad, I beseech thee. Oh, great provider of this home. You know, you know, <laughs> you know right? Don't you know those dads? Whenever your, your kids do that to you, I go, okay, what do you want? Right? <laughs> Whatever that. Whenever your little girl, Mariah, goes, Daddy, how you doing? You're looking good today. Are you slimming down? Anyway, you know, I, I know something. <laughs> Hopefully we're not buttering God up because he sees our heart, but we're sincere, right? But he resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. The Webster quotes George Washington here, and he says this. Show the picture of George Washington, would you? Do you have a picture of George Washington? I don't think I gave you that, did I? Do you have it last week's picture or no? Can you get it? Come on, hurry up. No, but anyway. <laughs> George Washington, he, it shows a picture of him kneeling down at Valley Forge. Now, it's funny. You go there. This is, you're not sure our country's going the wrong way a little bit. I went there to Mount Vernon. Was it with you, Mariah? And the guy goes, well, that picture isn't real. And I want to go up to the guy. It was a big crowd. I would have. And I go, were you there? Are you that old? I mean, he's old, but I'm like, you were there, so you knew that one. He goes, that wasn't real. That was just made up. <sighs> you know, don't you love revisionists? I mean, I just like, really, okay. You can look online. There's prayers of George Washington that will blow your mind. Here's a George Washington who's a deist, they say, but if he's a deist, then I want to be one. He says, without a humble imitation of the divine author, Jesus, of our blessed religion, they use the word religion a lot, but they meant Christianity, we can never hope to be a happy nation. That's a deist, they say. I mean, the revisionist. That's his heart. I read his prayer, and one of his prayers said this. This is what he said. He said, Lord, and this is a general. This is the first president of the United States. Powerful man, 6'2". The average height then was 5'7". He was a monster. He was huge, giant. He said, Lord, today I've failed you. I've not lived up to my potential. I haven't served you the way I should. I haven't sought you like I should. But Lord, please, in your mercy, do not deal with me as I deserve, but deal with me under the grace and mercy of your Son and his blood, the Lord Jesus Christ. Wow. Most of the time we're going, hey, come on, God, I'm king, kid. Move. He's saying, God, I might be all that to a lot of people, but I am not all that to you. And I humbly say, God, I haven't been what I should. Please don't deal with me as I deserve, but deal with me through your grace. That's why I love what D.L. Moody said. He said, the branches that bow the most bear the most fruit. Do you get it? The branches that bow, he said, I'm sorry, bow the lowest, bear the most fruit. You bow low, you humble yourself, God will exalt you. He'll lift you up as we're going to see. But you exalt yourself, he resists you, and you'll be put down. We always say here at Calvary, the way up in the kingdom is down, and the way down in the kingdom is up. Right? You humble yourself, exalted by God. You exalt yourself, put down by God. And how, how many do not like prideful people? Can you raise your hand? There you go. Right, unless you're a prideful person. I like myself. We don't, no, but you know, we don't like it. You tend to go, uh, you right? You don't like it when someone's proud. Here's what he called, here's what President Washington, George Washington called the National Day of Prayer. We call it the National Day of Prayer. You know what he called it? Listen to this. See if there's any change here. He called it the National Day of Prayer and Fasting and Humiliation. Isn't that weird? We kind of got rid of fasting. We like to eat. Nope, sorry, I'm not going to do that. And definitely not going to be humble. He called it prayer, the National Day of Prayer, Fasting and Humiliation. How many know when you get that back? And not just once a year. Every time we worship God, get back to humiliation, humbling ourselves before God. If you're not sure that George Washington had great favor, there he is, had great favor from God, this man, this deist, and I'm saying that facetiously, this supposed deist, he was in the French-Indian Wars. Everyone around him was getting shot. And I've looked up the, the you can look it up online, in the, the textbooks in schools today do not say that anymore. They used to about 40 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago. 20, 30, something. But now they don't say it. But he got two horses shot out from under him. Some say three. Two horses shot out from him. And he had three, and some people say four bullet holes through his jacket, all the way through, both sides. Not one scratch on him. How many like to have that protection, especially in this day and age? Look what he did. Think what that's like for a general to bow his knee so someone saw it, and in the snow... 
and just cry out to God. He would cry out for God's provision, for providence. I love what providence, you know, the providence. I'm like, what's providence? I kind of know it, but I don't. Providence means divine protection, divine intervention, divine, uh, basically we call it divine appointments. God would just bless his day. How, how many want that? He says, I want providence, God's providence. And he says, God's favor and God's protection. And I'll tell you, when you can have two horses shot up from under you and have three bullet holes through your jacket all the way through and not get scratched, something's up. And I, let's do that, amen? Because that's a great man. And he was so humble. You can see it even in the movie. I was watching a movie about him. And he, you know, John Adams saying, we need to call you emperor or whatever, you know, all these titles. He goes, I am just the president. He got mad because saying, I don't want to be like a king. I don't want to be a martyr. How many know George Washington? They wanted to bury him in the center of the Capitol, in the bottom. I've been there, the crypt. Has anyone been in the crypt? It's, it's where, and he said, no, I just want to be buried at my uh, farm. They said, too, he could keep being president. And he said, no, I want to actually go home and be a farmer. How many know that would not happen today if they said that today? <laughs> I'll be a lifetime politician. He goes, back in the old days, they actually wanted to work. They actually said, this is service. I want to get back to real work. You know, I want to be a farmer. John Adams said it. He said it. How many of you'd never get him out if that was still true today? Anyway, Philippians 2.10 says this, that the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of those in heaven and of those on earth and those under the earth. Verse 11, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. I'm not a Greek scholar. I eat Greek food, but I'm not a Greek scholar. But here it is. I'm told by Greek scholars that this is hyper-glorification. Jesus was already glorified, right? He's God Almighty, but he's now hyper-glorification, where it's like the name of Jesus is above everything now. Jesus, Jesus. And it's where Jesus' name is like everyone's going to bow, everyone's going to confess the name of Jesus, and everyone's going to say he's, he's God. And hear this, why did God exalt, God the Father exalt Jesus? Why? Why did he exalt his name above every name? Here it is, look at verse 8 of the same chapter of Philippians 2, verse 8. It's talking about Jesus. It says, being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. So do you hear that? He, he was in the garden. Remember he said, he said, Father, is there any way for this cup to pass? Is there any way that I can redeem mankind without going to the cross and being separate? I don't think it was the cross he was so afraid of. It was the separation. He'd never been separated from the Father. He says, there's any way. Let it pass. And, and we didn't hear, we don't hear in the Bible what the Father said, but we know he said no. And Jesus then said what? Not my will, but your will be done. And I love it. Extreme charismatics will say what? You don't have to ask the Lord for anything. You just command the Lord. You just say, I speak it in the name of Jesus. If your Lord and Savior needs to say, Father, here's my request, and God the Father said, no, thank you, but no. How many know no is an answer? And he said no, and Jesus said, okay. Not my will, but your will be done. Jesus was God there, but he says, okay. And because of that humbling himself and submitting to God, the Father, and saying, okay, I will die on a cross. I'll be separated from you. I'll die a criminal's death even though I'm sinless. He was then exalted by the Father in a mighty, mighty way. How many know this, guys? You humble yourself before God in love, you will always be exalted. It might take a little while, but God will always exalt you. Amen? Amen? But we see the cross and we go, this isn't worth it. I can't do it. I can't do it. But how many know? We all love Resurrection Sunday, don't we? Amen. So you have to, before, you have to die on a cross, die to self, to have a resurrection, have a powerful resurrection. Amen. Most of us want God to bestow his blessings and favor upon us like Jesus. But the question is, do we humble ourselves before him like Jesus did? Do we say, God, here's my request, but not my will, but your will be done. I love this. I'm going to say this. George Mueller said, you know the reason why most people's prayer, George Mueller, the great prayer war in the 1800s, he says, you know why most people's prayers do not get answered? Because people think that prayer is to change God's will, for me to say, God, do this, and to exercise my will on God. But he says, really, prayer is for me to make requests, but ultimately to say, God, not my will, but your will be done. Your will be done. Show me what you want. How many know that will change your prayer life, won't it? 
Now, some of us might be frustrated because some of us have a wonderful plan for God. I'm saying that facetiously, right? But how many know God has a wonderful plan for you and I? But guess what? His ways are not like our ways. His way is not usually the easiest way. How many know that? A lot of times God's way is the hardest way, but it's the most fruitful way. Amen? Hebrews 5, 7 says this, talking about the same thing in the Garden of Gethsemane. It says, During the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with loud cries and tears. So you can humbly have loud cries and tears in prayer. You can worship loud. He says he, he made petitions with loud cries and tears to the one who could save him from death or the cross. And he was, hear this, this is key, Jesus is God, sinless. He says he was heard because he yelled at God strongly. No, it says he was heard because of his reverent submission. If Jesus had to reverently submit to the Father's will in prayer, how much more should you and I reverently submit to the Lord in prayer? Amen? Amen. Amen. He was heard. Think about it. So reverse that. If he wasn't reverent and submissive, he wouldn't probably have been heard. But because he was heard because of his reverent submission. So if you're here today and you say, man, I don't feel like my prayers are heard, then you have to ask yourself, am I really submitted to God? You know what submitted to God means? Coming under his authority and his will. It means to say, God, here's my request like Jesus, but at the end of the day, your will be done. I love how George Mueller said about his wife. His wife got sick. His wife, she got some kind of fever. And he said, Lord, here's his prayer. Lord, I know you can heal my wife. I've seen you heal. And I ask if it's best for me that she be with me, then I ask you to heal her. But it's best in your will that she be with you, then take her with you. Your will be done. And guess what? God took her and he said he rejoiced. He did her funeral. He rejoiced because he said, I know this was God's will. How many know that'll change everything if you can rest and say, the Lord, you know, remember what Paul says? To live as Christ that dies again. As a Christian, we can't lose. You know, someone said, I heard this pastor say the other day, you're not going to threaten me with heaven. <laughs> Heaven's a good thing, right? You know, I always say, just shoot right here, you know, right there. I mean, to live is Christ, we're living for God, and to die is gain. So it's a good thing. We can't lose as Christians, amen? You guys awake? Is this good? Is this all right? Okay. I'm trying not to say amen a lot, you know, because people say, I'm not used to an amen preacher. I'm just, well, I just want reaction. Are you there? Are you awake? Are you there? You know, that's all I want. Just a little love. All right. James 4.10 says this. Humble yourselves in the presence of the Lord. So hear that. We're here worshiping. We're in the presence of God. Amen? amen. It says when two or three are gathered in his name, he's there in their midst. The presence of God. So humble yourself in the presence of the Lord, and he will what? Exalt you. And, I, and you, know, you know how we just hear Scripture go, oh yeah, exalt, that's cool, yeah. I looked up the word exalt in the Greek, and here's what it is. The word exalt here means to rise to prosperity. How many could use a little of that, right? Some prosperity. Not prosperity doctrine, but prosperity. Rise to dignity. A lot of us want dignity. Rise to honor and happiness. How many would like God to exalt them? I would. God, not me, God. But the way you do that, again, what? Humble yourself. Come under the authority of God. The word exalt, as I said, the word exalt here means to be happy. I, I tell you, a lot of us are miserable. Hear this, I believe, because we're not submitted to God. The Bible says, perfect peace have those whose hearts are stayed on thee. Or you could say given to thee. You don't have peace because you're maybe striving with God, saying do it my way, and God's saying no, you do it my way. It's like he, he really believes he's God. He does. And he really believes you should obey him. And, and hear this. We can either think he's our servant boy or we can realize he's God now and start being pre prepared to meet him in heaven and to start worshiping him the way we should here rather than being shocked in heaven. Amen? Amen. Especially we need to humble ourselves today in the area of worship, even when we don't feel like worshiping. Hear this, guys. Satan will tell you this. If you don't feel like worshiping and you worship, you're a hypocrite. How many have heard that stuff, right? The devil will say, oh, if you don't feel it, right? Those are the world say, if it feels good, do it. If you feel it, you got to feel it. How many, no, 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 the Bible doesn't say that. 
Satan will say, you're a hypocrite. If you come to worship, you don't feel like worship. You got in a fight with your wife. You got in a fight with your kids. The AC broke. Your car radiator leaking. Whatever, you know, the things that happen on the way to church. And you're just like, ugh. And you're like, I'm not going to worship because that's a hypocrite. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to worship. Hear this. A hypocrite is someone who pretends to be something they're not. So here's a hypocrite. If you come to church just because there's some hot girl here, and you're pretending to worship, hey, how you doing? What's up? That's a hypocrite. Or if you're here for some girl or guy, and you're just like, hey, there's this one person in our church, I won't say their name, but there's one person in our church who's just like, praise the Lord, hallelujah, hands up, and talking to their neighbor. Yeah, praise, hey, yeah, so, so what happened? Who's dating what? Who's on Dynasty? I mean, you know what I mean? It's like, that's a hypocrite. But it's not a hypocrite when you are not feeling like worship and you worship God. You break through and you press in. I want to tell you, sometimes I've come here and I've worshiped like, oh, when I've been so angry. Do you remember, how many of you have been around where we had a B problem? And Kevin fixing the bees. God bless Kevin. I love Kevin. He works very hard. But Kevin plugged up the bee hole. And so the bees then went in the, the, the ceiling and the bees are coming in my office. There's bees just dropping. I'm doing my message. Bees. You know, and I have to have a water bottle with soap and it's squirting bees. And I'm like, Aah! on a Wednesday night. This is when I was teaching. I was like, Aah! and I came in. And I'm like, you know what? I can't. I can't. God, I cannot go to service. I am not prepared. I'm, I mean, I'm just like, and Lord goes, suck it up, wimpy. Let's go. And I went in there and I just like, Aah! and I worship God. I mean, it was a little bit. Tense worship, but I mean, I finally, and God met me. Amen? Because God sees your heart. He sees that you don't feel like it. You don't, you're not happy, but you go, God, you're still good despite what's going on with me. No, Kevin was great. He didn't know. He did, we didn't know. We thought the soffit was sealed, but this building is pretty interesting in some ways. But anyway, George. Yeah, <laughs> yeah anyway. But hear this, when you worship and you don't feel like it, the Bible calls in Hebrews 13, 15, a sacrifice of praise. We need to have more of a sacrifice of praise. That means, you know, because think about how easy it for Satan to make you not happy. Oh, let's give him a flat tire on the way to church. Let's have him have a fight. And then you go, see, I can't worship now. I wanted to, but I can't. God, sorry. I'm mad at my wife. You've got to press in even harder because that honors God because it's a sacrifice of praise. And again, God sees your heart. Hear this, Psalms 42, 11. Here's what David says. It says, why are you so downcast, O oh my soul? Don't you like that? He asks himself a question. See, you need to ask yourself a question. You need to talk to God in yourself. Just, you know, sometimes we're depressed. You ever be depressed? You don't know why you're depressed? You're just depressed? I'm depressed. I don't know why I'm depressed. That's really weird. I'm depressed. Right? And we just kind of go, well, let's go with it. No. David goes, what is your problem? Soul, what is going on? And I believe if you ask God, don't just talk to your soul, but asking God, what is going on? How many of God will usually tell you? And you can go, oh, yeah, that's right. I haven't sought you in about 10 days. Maybe that's it. Why are you so downcast, oh, my soul? And then he says, why so disturbed within me? So he's asking questions, but then hear this. I love this. He says, put your hope in God. Do you like that? He speaks to his soul. You put your hope in God. Quit being a wimp. Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him. Don't you like that? I'll tell you this, when we, we first started this church, two years into it, I bought, we bought 10 acres of land right on La Choya and Tangerine. Beautiful property. Had a beautiful ranch house. We're going to use that as offices in Sunday school. And then it had a big observatory. How many remember the ranch? Anyone remember the ranch? And, and then we had this observatory. It's a big slab. Most of you saw that. But the first week we owned a big observatory. Ceilings this high, about this size, maybe a little bigger building, 2,500 square feet. Beautiful, furred out. It's going to be our sanctuary. So we're cleaning it out. First week, not even the first week. I don't think we've had it a week. We're cleaning it out. All of a sudden, we go eat lunch, we clean it out, and the sheriff that goes to our church says the, the, the observatory is burning to the ground. And I'm like, ha, you're such a kidder. I'm not kidding, Pastor Craig. I look out the restaurant. It's about a mile, two miles away. There's a big smoke cloud, big mushroom cloud. I'm like, oh, my goodness. I had signed my house, co-signed, because we were a young church, me and two other elders co-signed our houses. So that means if we can't make payment on this, my house is gone. A little equity I have, gone. I got a little scared. And I'm sitting there, and I'm driving there, and I'm going, God, 
We haven't even had this a week. What are you doing? Ever said that to God? Oh, yeah. God, are you, are you, do you not like me? What did I, Lord. And the Lord, I just heard this statement from a pastor that I knew. He said, if you can laugh later, how many say, oh, I can laugh now. He says, if you can laugh later, you might as well laugh now. If you can rejoice later, you might as well rejoice now. And so all of a sudden I go, okay. I just heard it from God. I go, okay. So I just started saying, God, I don't know what you're doing, but this, I, I praise you. I trust you. I was so rejoicing when I got there. This is real. Metro was there. They're investigating it. The guy said, suspected arson. Man seemed too happy. Isn't that great? <laughs> and, but we didn't have, uh, the realtor didn't tell us to get the real metro. It was lapsed. So they put the fire out. This will show you how we weren't doing it for a scam. Our bill was $95,000 for the fire to put it out. Because we hadn't paid. You know how you have to pay the real metro to pay? I mean, they waived it because, well, our realtor took care of it. But, you know, that's the way we should be. Amen. And I just chose. I heard God say it, and I said, okay, you know what? I'm going to praise you. I'm going to put my hope in God. I'm going to praise you. I still don't know. I feel like Job. I still don't know why God allowed that thing to burn down. Well, we probably wouldn't have this building. But how many know there's certain things you're not going to know until heaven? Amen. Just like Job, you're going to have to say, okay, I trust you. Amen. A lot of us today need to say, God, I'm making a choice to rejoice. Whether I'm feeling it, or not. And sometimes it's great. You come into worship, you just, oh, and every, all the best songs. But how many knows? Even if you don't like the songs, it's not for you. I don't like the song. Sorry. Right? It's for God. Okay? You don't, you don't go, you don't go with your wife, you'll go, I don't like that present for my husband. I don't like it. It matters what he likes. Okay? It matters what God likes. It doesn't matter what you like. I don't like the way this song is. They're doing it too fast. I don't like it. It matters. God, are you happy? God, are you being honored? Are you being respected? Are you being worshipped? I like what Pastor Chuck Smith used to say. He said, first comes the motions, then comes the emotions. Sometimes we're not feeling it and we go, oh, whatever. But if you have ever done a sacrifice of praise, how many know that's usually the times where you really meet God powerfully? Because God sees your heart and God goes, my goodness, you really, you really stepped out of your comfort zone and you worship me even when you didn't feel like it. And that's when God just says, I love you. I tell you, you want to hear the most exciting thing? When I was at Grace Chapel, here's what God would do when his glorious presence would come so powerfully. I would be convicted so much so that I would literally run to the altar weeping because I was so aware of my sins. And I would cry like, <laughs> you ever do those like little kid cries? <laughs> I mean, I'd be crying like that. And then God would say to me, yet you're a sinner, but I love you. And then immediately I'd cry the other way. He loves me. God loves me. Oh. And I'd be, it was like the craziest emotion you ever, you went from sinner, I'm such a loser, to God loves me. Oh. You know, I mean, it was like, this is great. How many, has anyone experienced that ever? Or am I the only weirdo? One person. All right. I'm a weirdo. But that's what would happen. And it was amazing. It was incredible, and I want to see that happen again. Third point. I might not even be able to get to my third point. But anyways, there's no, he said, bowing of the knee before me. Second Chronicles 6 talks about King Solomon dedicating the first temple. I want us to look at that real quick. I'll try to go fast. But I want to prove to you that these things are not just my whims of thinking God wants this and God wants that. I want to show you pictures in the Bible of what happened. Here's what he says, Second Chronicles 6, 12. Solomon stood before the altar of the Lord in front of the entire community. This is the first temple before they had a tabernacle, a tent, but now it's the temple. In front of the entire community of Israel and lifted his hands in prayer. So there it is, lifting hands. What does lifting hands mean? You're trying to find a good reception. There, oh, there's the Holy Spirit. No, it's surrender to God, right? When someone puts a gun in your face, what do you usually do? What do most people do? Hands up, right? Surrender. That's what we're doing. We're surrendering to God. That's all it is. For all you Baptists out there like me, that's all it is, surrendering. Or as my daughter says, surrenderance, right? So surrender. Lift his hands in prayer, verse 13. Now Solomon had made a bronze platform seven and a half feet long, seven and a half feet wide, four and a half feet high, and had placed it in the center of the temple, the temple's outer court. He stood on the platform and knelt 
in front of the entire community. So he knelt in front of everybody. The community of Israel lifted his hands for his presence. So here he is. So picture him. He's kneeling down in front of everyone, a bronze altar, and it's, bronze was judgment, and he's raising his hands like this, praying. And he prays a whole chapter. He prays a whole chapter, chapter 6. You should read it on your own. As a lot of you know, the altar is where something was sacrificed to the Lord. So in a sense, hear this, King Solomon was lifting his hands and bowing before the Lord, dedicating himself as what? A living sacrifice. A living sacrifice to the Lord, as Paul speaks of in Romans 12.1. What does he say? So dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God. Hear this, young people. Don't give your bodies to women. Don't give your bodies to men. Give your body to the Lord. Sanctified means set apart. Let your body be set apart so that when you get married, it is blessed by God. And if you've blown it, just start fresh. Start fresh. But don't go, don't believe a lie of the devil. Oh, I've already blown it, so I might as well keep doing it. No. Let your body be set apart and sanctified. It says, give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Do it because you love God. Let them be a living, holy sacrifice, your body, the kind he will find acceptable. There's that word acceptable again. He wants your body to be holy. This is truly the way to worship him. So guys, you know why some of us, I think it's hard to worship? Because we've done a lot of bad things with our body. And it's hard to come into God's presence when we know, oh, this is why another thing I try to say to you is get right with God before you come here. Amen. Don't try to get, spend 10 minutes in the service getting right with God. Get right with God on the way here. Instead of fighting with your wife, start praying and say, God, and just confess and say, God, I've done some things this week I shouldn't, and get your heart right with God. Amen? Amen. Now, if you're not sure that bowing and lifting up your hands to the Lord in holy reverence means a lot to God, listen to this. Now go to 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 1. Here's God's response to Solomon, bowing humbly before him, giving his life in surrender to God. Here's what he says. When Solomon finished praying, fire flashed down from heaven and burned up the offerings and sacrifices. How many know that's a good day? Right? You didn't have to light it. Poof, there you go. And hear this. And the glorious presence of the Lord filled the temple. Three times we're going to hear about the glorious presence, the glorious presence, the glorious presence. How many want that again? I want the glorious presence in my life, in this house, in my house at home, in my car, the glorious presence of God. It says, fill the temple, verse 2. And the priest could not enter the temple of the Lord because of his glorious presence. How, much you, how many of you would like for me not to be able to preach? Some of you go, hey, man, hallelujah, right? Pray for the glorious presence just to, and fall, you know, just pray that. It says the glorious presence of the Lord filled it. Verse 3, when all the people of Israel saw the fire coming down and the glorious presence of the Lord filling the temple, they fell face down on the ground and worshiped and praised the Lord, saying he is good. His faithful love endures forever. Can we say that? He is good. His faithful love endures forever. Love that. You know, it's funny. I'll tell you this. There's a, we get our worship from a lot of places, but this one place supposedly had the glory of its presence and the Shekinah glory in a cloud, and, and they saw it, and they were, but this is how I knew it wasn't real, in my opinion, because they were taking selfies with the glory of God. When I've seen, believe it or not, I know you're going to freak out on this, but when I, I told you that time I ran to the altar at Grace, I literally wept and looked up and I saw like a cloud. And I go, God, I must have cried so hard. My eyes are foggy. I, I, I'm serious, I thought that. I was new to the church. I just thought, man, I cried so hard. This is a, you know, and I thought, I just fogged up my eyes. And I'd never done that before, but I thought, maybe that's it. You know, it's got to be a logical explanation. And all of a sudden, everyone's at the altar. I ran first, and then everyone else, I thought I was the only one. And then and everyone goes afterwards. They said, did you see the cloud? The glorious presence. And I'm like, that was, I saw that. When you see the glorious presence, you're not going to be taking selfies. You're going to be on your face before God. You're going to be weeping. You're going to be realized. When you stand in the holy light of God, you're going to see how sinful you are. Remember what Isaiah saw? He says, woe is me, I'm undone. I'm sinful, I'm dead. That's what he's saying. I'm undone. I can't take this. 
That's what happens when you get in the presence of God. It's not, hey, you know, it, no. I'll end with this. I said I wouldn't go long, but I lie. One of the words for worship in the New Testament is the Greek word proskuneo. Proskuneo is where we get the word prostrate. I always say prostate because I'm older, right? Prostate, right? No, prostrate. It's where you lay flat out, right? Listen to this definition from the Strong's. And for those of you who are Bible scholars, it's uh, Strong's 4352. And this is a New Testament. This is an Old Testament. Proskuneo means to kiss like a dog licking his master's hand. Isn't that amazing? Does that kind of put you where you and I are with God? We think, woo, we're equal. No. You're a dog licking the master's hand. And hear this. I try to think of it logically because I have a dog. You don't have a dog? Some of you like kiss your dog. No. No. I, my dog eats weird stuff. I don't kiss my dog. I don't even like him licking my hands because he's had worms before, and I don't want it. I don't need, you know, I've seen the movie Creature Within. No, I don't need this thing growing out more. No. I let my dog lick my feet, and even my wife goes, honey, worms can come from that too. And I'm like, whatever, I'll just lick it. And he's, he, licks, he loves to lick my feet. My feet must stink really good. But anyway... And I go, so then I think about that. That's how we're supposed to be. So like a dog licking his master's hand. And then I think, John the Baptist said, one coming after me, I'm not worthy to untie his sandals. So then I say, if, I'm not, if John the Baptist is a really godly man and was unworthy to tie his sandals, how much more should I be unworthy like a dog to kiss his hand? So if you ever see me worship, hopefully you're not watching me worship, but if you do, sometimes I go like this. And I go like that. And what I'm doing is I'm picturing kissing God, but I'm touching the tips of his feet. Because I realize that just like I don't like my dog licking my hand, not that Jesus doesn't like me licking his hand, but I'm saying is the humble picture of that he's God and I'm a puppy dog that should just go and touch his feet. How many know that's a good picture of where we are? That's what proskuneo means. It means this, to fawn over, to crouch, to literally or figuratively prostrate oneself in homage, to reverence, to revere him, to adore him, to worship, to fall upon the knees, to touch the ground with the forehead as an expression of profound reverence. Do you hear that? It's saying not just to bow. It's saying bow your head and hands. So this is what they used to do in the East they used to put their forehead on the ground because they wouldn't even want to look at the person even though they're bowing. They put their head like this. Do you know how humble that is? Have you ever, I did it this morning. It hurts. Has anyone laid prostrate on the, even on a rug? When you're a big boy like me, I don't know what happens, but it hurts. But that's what they do, and they'd probably do it on marble floors. They'd probably do it on hard surfaces. My point I want to make is, do you realize how much we've gotten away from what the word of definition of worship is? We hardly ever bow our knee. Hardly ever bow our knee. It says lying in a prostate position of humility and adoration. How many of you, like me, want the glorious presence to fill our lives? Then you have to be willing. We have to be willing to humbly bow before the Lord and reverently lift our hearts and lift our hands to him. And when you and I do this sincerely like King Solomon did, like so many others who did, like George Washington did, then we will get the same results as they got, I believe. And you say, how do you know that, Pastor Craig? Because Acts 10.34 says, God is no respecter of persons. You know, some Calvinists will say, oh, God just chooses one man to be great and another man to be nothing. Hear this. Do you know what? David was a man after God's own heart. And we just say, oh, God might have chosen him. He just chose him to be that. No. I believe God chose David, but, but here's why. Listen to what it says in Acts 13, 22 about David. It says, David was a man after God. He replaced Saul. He was a man after David, or God's own heart because he did everything God wanted him to do. Do you hear that? You can be a man after God's own heart. You can be a woman after God's own heart as long as you commit your life to say, God, I'll do not my will, but your will be done. Isn't that encouraging? God's not saying, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't really pick you for anything great. All you have to do 
is say, God, I'll do whatever you want me to do. I'll do whatever you want. As one man of God said, we can either bow now or we can bow later. But we're all going to bow before him someday. So it might as well be today. So I want us to worship and to just do. I'm not going to tell you what to do. But I want you to be, if you can, and you feel led to bow. I want you, if you can, lift your hands. I want you to just give yourself fully to God as if God was really here because he is. And to say, God, I worship you. I give myself to you. I submit. And maybe some of you need to cry a little because you need to realize my life hasn't been submitted to God. I've been calling the shots. I've been doing my own thing and saying, bless what I'm doing. And some of you need to just say, God, I worship you by just surrendering my life to you. I'm not getting saved. Some of you might need to get saved, but most of you just need to say, God, I am tired. You sit in the driver's seat. I'm going to be led by you. You take me where you want me to go. So we need to revere him, humble before him, humble ourselves, and bow the knee. Worship team, will you come up now? Someone can get the lights. If you want, you know, and, and hear this, guys. I don't want this to be condemnation. Some of you can't physically bow. But how many know you can bow your heart? You can bow your head. You can just sit in the chair and just do this. But God sees your heart. And, and just really be aware of that. God seeing your heart. Not worrying about your neighbor. Not worrying about your spouse. But just saying, I want to worship God. And we're going to take some time right now to worship him. Please don't move if you don't have to. Don't leave if you don't have to. But if you have to, you can just quietly go out. But we want this to be a time of great worship. I want this to be where we really, this is, we're starting a new realm of our church of worship. Amen? So let's, uh, we can, you can sit, stand, whatever you want. Let's worship the Lord with all our heart right now.
Let's do this next Sunday. Let's do this the rest of our life until we meet Jesus face to face. Father, I just thank you for this day. And I ask that, Lord, you have begun this good work and completed, Lord, that you would seal this in our hearts, that we, this would be normal for us. This wouldn't be a once-a-year thing. This would be the rest of our life, thing. that we would worship. We're getting prepared for heaven to revere you, to humble ourselves before you, to bow our knees, to have tears of joy and tears of conviction. And Father, may we learn to bow the knee. Every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess us. So, Lord, we choose to bow now. Let this spirit of worship permeate our homes. Let the glorious presence of you be with us this whole week. Till we meet either Wednesday or Sunday, but that we will be people who, as you said, Jesus, that the Father is seeking people who worship him in spirit and truth. We want to be those people. Amen. Mm -hmm. Let's sing it one last time.